Welcome to our lecture on the Romance of the Rose, Le Roman de la Rose. This was a very important uh, piece of literature, a, a long poem um, having an effect for centuries afterwards in the Middle Ages. You'll see he had this had an influence on Chaucer, plays into Christine de Pizan's life. Uh, there are it's a funny work, it's a composite work. There are two authors, Guillaume de Rois around. Uh, 1230 composes uh, 4,000 lines or so, and he does not round it off. So we have this allegorical dream vision. A, an author, maybe 45 years later, named Jean de Meun, uh, takes it up and more than quadruples it, uh, adds almost 18,000 more lines. And between those dates, um, the early 1200s, the late, so much happens in world history. This is the century of high scholasticism. This is the ferment when the uh, fruits of the East, quote unquote, uh, from Byzantium and from uh, the Islamic world comes into Western Europe and the great intellectuals have to grapple with, or the introduction of Aristotle and, and the claims of reason in a very profound way. Alongside that history, which is perhaps more known than the social uh, background, is this, um, this thought world, this imaginative atmosphere of courtly love. Now that concept, courtly love, it's a, it's a modern term. Uh, it's, there are many scholars who dispute whether we should even use the concept at all. Um, but it seems to me, and, and C.S. Lewis, strangely enough, is, is one of the most important um, progenitors of this concept as having arisen, as naming some phenomenon that arises in the 12th century, and it seems to have not many precedents, and that he does in the allegory of love where he treats the romance of the rose. Again, it's disputed, but there seems to be a shift in subjectivity that is going on in the high middle ages, the differentiation of the individual, of the personality, and courtly love would seem to be very much a part of it because in fact, this is the way we feel our uh, emotional lives. And that's why uh, this question might have a great resonance for, for us. Can love bear the weight of our aspirations? We put the meaning of the universe often on this one little word, love. It's meant to span heaven and earth, all the, uh, the various goods of the world, the, the things that we hope to attain. The, um, I mean, what a good life would be. Would, it's bound up with this little word, love. And that was not, that cer whatever C.S. Lewis, whatever the worth, or how, however that thesis of his holds up as further uh, evidence comes to light, it is clear that something happens in the Middle Ages that is different from what is available for the emotional life of people in antiquity. This passionate love as being something not just a madness, which is clearly the way, for instance, the Greeks figured it, Ate. It was, it was crazy to fall in love. Sexuality could be either treated in a very easygoing way or or in a Roman more uh, controlled way, but uh, passionate love was never something that was um, praised in the, the great non-cultural discourse. But that clearly has changed. So what we have in this poem is, is a, a prime instance of courtly love or, or whatever it is that we still as moderns feel. So the, the citizen of the modern nation state, the consumer, the, our desires, they do revolve around this new kind of love. So a lot of issues come into play, and we, we want to see how it's different even from this poem. The allegory is very uh, estranging for us as a, as a kind of genre. We don't feel our emotions this way. We don't think of our interior life in terms of these characters. But if we can try to reach into that uh, world, we might find that this is less strange than at first sight. So what Jean de Mont does, do, uh, what he does to the shape of the poem by adding so much, he, he 
makes it much more encyclopedic, which is just the high medieval habit. They loved, they were hungry at this point to get all of that uh, knowledge from the Islamic world, say, and to just amass it, scientific and so on. And that he, uh, Jean stuffs this poem with that. It becomes much more dialectic. It's it's not it's not about a man in love and the for and, and the internal drama involved in that so much anymore, or it's become much more than that. The debates about what is worth while um, the dialectic becomes much more prominent. It as opposed to the earnestness of Guillaume's portion of the poem, it, it becomes much more satirical in tone. That's obvious. You go from the court gentility of Guillaume to the university disputatiousness of Jean. Jean was a product of the University of Paris. So what we saw with Avalar, the, the kind of distant origins of the university there, the greatest university in the world at the time, the center of theological knowledge, which was the master science at the time. Uh, Jean was part of that. He, he, he was part of that strife with the mendicant orders. He was on... He was opposed to them. He was a much more worldly man. So definitely on the other side from Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure and that. Uh, and they, they die just about the time that Jean is working on this poem. Uh, you see Guillaume talking about ideal love. I mean, this is the most, the highest uh, pitch of courtly love. And Jean takes it down to very much real sensuality. And uh, interestingly enough, a way of framing sex that might be more moralistic, actually, sex in terms of procreation. That, that seems to be, well, maybe what he's saying. As far as background for this, one has to distinguish between the feudal, the chivalric, and uh, courtly love. The feudal arrangement was early Middle Ages, especially, where power and uh, social order came from the, the, the simple assertion of, of will, by these uh, illiterate German uh, warriors that constituted the uh, aristocracy of the post-Roman world. They had the ability to bully and they got what they could get. This, became, this aristocracy became militarized with technological in innovations such as the stirrup and the high back saddle, which made it possible to have these armored, mounted knights, the chevalier, the, the, chevalier, the, the horsemen, the, the tank, as they say, of the medieval world. The, to have an armored man on horseback that was, given the uh, military technology of the time, that was a very powerful weapon. And these knights would be uh, constellated often around a castellan that is a, a, a noble who had been able to build a castle and uh, was able to lord it over a realm. Castles were, were very difficult to place under royal control. And so when, especially in the French lands, the Frankish lands of the west of the old uh, Frankish empire, as it descended into this feudal um, breakdown of power, you had castles go up and had these local warlords with knights attached. All right, so uh, that's the feudal order where you have knights pledging their uh, loyalty, their vas their, they are vassals to a lord, and in return, they're given lands enough to support their uh, armor, their horses, the, the, enough to make it possible for them to be warriors in the service of the lord. All right, so that's the feudal order. As the uh, Middle Ages comes out of the depopulated and de-urbanized darkness into a uh, something more like a functioning civilization, you have the emergence of chivalry as an ideology. It's something that the, the church was very interested in cultivating. It's an ideology that had these kinds of precepts to serve God, obey the church, protect the weak and poor. Um, it valued loyalty to the Lord, that is your earthly master, it valued prowess, that is skill in battle, valor, mercy. This was a, an ideal that the church wanted to um, promulgate because the 
the destruction caused by aristocratic violence was immense. Plunder monasteries, they would hurt peasants and, and, and so on. So chivalry was a way of trying to gentle uh, aristocratic manners. And we still have that sense, right? A gentleman is someone who has been, I mean, that sense, this, is, this comes back, goes back to the Roman uh, notion of, of what would it mean to be of the, right, one of the honeste ores as opposed to humiliores or as opposed to being a barbarian. You, you had a certain education in the classics. You had gentler manners. That was part of the, um, the sign, at least of the Roman aristocracy. Well, this was, the, was trying to get these Germanic warlords to, to have some kind of gentleness. Uh, it was more an ideal, obviously, than a reality. But, but that, was, that was something the church tried to uh, advocate, along with things like the peace and truce of God movements, just ways of trying to limit noble violence. More as the economy became monetarized, remonetarized, the cities began to grow, and the uh, going into uh, the, the year 1000 and, and beyond, you have these castellans with their castles. They became courts with kind of a managerial bureaucracy, and there'd be a lay wing of these bureaucracies, but also a clerical wing. You have um, court chaplains, priests that were and other clerics who were attached to uh, local rulers. And in this milieu, you have the emergence of what Lewis called courtly life. Uh, the word that was used, one of the words used at the time uh, was fan amour, that is uh, fine, um, fine love, uh, a, a choice love. And this Courtly love can be distinguished from chivalry. Chivalry was a, a, a Christianized warrior ethos. Chivalry, uh, courtly love is something that is allied to that, but is distinct from it. Its origins are obscure. It's still a live issue. Does it just pop out of nowhere, as, as Lewis seems to indicate? There are reasons to think so. Two of the more prominent theories links uh, the rise of the, this new feel, sensibility of courtly love to either Arab Islamic influences or the Cathar Albigensian uh, movement of Southern France. So we'll, we'll look at, that, at each of these in turn. They're probably both related, as it turns out. The first troubadour, so the troubadours were the lyric poems who sang the songs of courtly love. The first one whose name we know is a duke, Duke William the Guillaume, the William the Ninth of Aquitaine, who died around 1127. His daughter was Eleanor of Aquitaine. Very important, very important woman. Her daughter was Marie of Champagne, another very important figure in this this, this lineage. Marie was uh, the patron of Andreas Capellanus, the author of *The Art of Courtly Love*. She had troubadours attached to her uh, court, and Bertrand de Born and Bernard de Vantadorn as two of them. And um, Chrétien de Troyes, who, whose name is here, who wrote the first fleshed out cycle of poems having to do with the King Arthur legend. He seems to have invented the Lancelot one. Well, he says uh, Marie was the one who inspired the, Lan the Lancelot poem. So she's a very important figure. These all, Aquitaine is in southern France. At the time, that was not part of any country of France. The nation did not exist as we know them. Uh, and indeed, uh, most of this land would go because of uh, Eleanor's second, I think, well, her marriage to Henry II would, would in the end get this territory into English hands as part of the Angevin, what we call the Angevin Empire, but that's another story. The Troubadour's heyday was from 1170 to 1210 or so. This region of southern France we call, as a modern kind of convention, Occitania, or Languedoc. That is the land of Oc. The, the big difference, one way of marking the difference linguistically between north and south France was that in the north you said um, yes by we, in the south you said Oc. So Occitania or Languedoc. This was the, so it's the southern part of France where this troubadour movement arose. It seems to have arisen in the eastern part of the southern 
France and moved westward towards Provence. And that's the general scope of it. Well, the courtly world that supported the troubadours uh, was destroyed by the Albigensian Crusade. This was a crusade that went from 1209 to 1229. The Dominicans were obviously very deeply involved with this. The Pope preached not only, so at this point, we have the first crusade preached in 1085 to retake Jerusalem. We have a second crusade and all the way up to actually before this, the fourth crusade had already happened where the, 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 the terror, the horror of the you know, sack of Constantinople in 1204. Um, so a few years later, the Pope is preaching not only against um, what non-Christians, not only against Eastern Christians, I guess it wasn't priests there, but the crusaders took that opportunity to do that. But then he's preaching directly against those in Christendom. And uh, the Albigensians were, uh, they believed in this dualism where there are two ultimate principles, good and evil. It's the old Gnostic story in, in, in one variation where um, matter is evil. It's part of the, the evil. It's allied to the evil, uh, the, the dark principle. And so the point is to try to get to the light, to get to the, the good principle. Why, why it would seem to be a Christian measure to deal with this, um, according to orthodoxy, this delusion to, to uh, kill and crush. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a devastating war. Uh, it's a little beyond me as a, as a, as a Christian myself. But, so you have, in fact, not only the Pope preaching, it seems for religious reasons, but in fact, in the north of France, the Capetians, who are trying to consolidate the territory that becomes modern France, they're using the Albigensian Crusade. So the northern lords come down, they, they devastate southern France, and the Capetians are, um, are advancing their goal of a larger kingdom. Okay, after that, where does the troubadours go? Well, the, the next important place is the court of Palermo, the Norman Saracen court uh, on Sicily. There's Roger II, so the Normans get all over Europe. It's fascinating, because that's a whole other series. These Frenchified ex-Vikings, they, they end up in Sicily. And then uh, within a few years after Roger II, you have the, the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick II, who uh, prefers to rule from the south of uh, Italy, and that's part of why the popes preach crusades against him, because they don't want to be hemmed in north and south of this Holy Roman Emperor. Not a very holy model for crusade, it seems, but in this Norman Saracen court, you had the remnants of the troopers come in, and from that pathway, Dante um, is drawn into this, or, or um, is able to draw from this tradition. So that's very important this goes on. The other conduits, if, if so there's the Albigensian linkage, it's linked geographically and in time, we don't know exactly how courtly love uh, sits with the Albigensian uh, worldview. The other pa possible pathway that seems most plausible is from the Arab world. You have the notion of ishq, which is passionate love that seems to come from this idea of a vine that, that squeezes the life out of what it's um, twisting around from a constriction, which is related to our work for uh, anguish. Uh, so love and anguish seem to be part of the conflict. And anybody who's, who's gone through unrequited love knows, knows this story. But that, that's something that was um, sung about by, by the Arab poets. And the courts of Castile and Aragon would have been an, an obvious place for that, uh, for Andalusian uh, poetry to get into um, Occitania. And we're not quite sure exactly how, what the balance of influences are. Romance itself comes from, so this is important because that's still a word that we use all the time. Uh, romance comes from metta en romance, which means to put into the romance language, to put into French in this case. That is to take something like the Aeneid and to make it into uh, the, the French language, but uh, putting a modern spin on it, as it were. Ovid was a very uh, big part of how the Romance writers uh, went about their business. Chrétien gives us the Arthur cycle and so on. The background for the uh, Romance of the Rose, which is 
opens with an, an internal drama, an allegory of what it means to uh, pursue a fine lady to whom one is devoted. And it opens for us the question, how do we want to devote our uh, desires? We have driving us the most profound instinct, it's the most ins profound insatiability, which people like Dante will, will link to good, the good and its infinity. Well, how do we access the infinity of good in the embodied life that we live? How, what do we do with this insatiability of desire? How do we live a good life? Meaning, how do we pursue goods and the good in a way that is noble and ennobling, in a way that is not merely self-gratifying, in a way that does justice to the um, infinity of our eros, that our heart and mind is reaching for something that it seems no one thing can satisfying and that's that's the drama we still experience in our modern subjective existence and that's why it is i think useful for us to try to grapple with an early phase of this modern subjectivity and hopefully even though the allegorical form is, is alien to us we'll see the we'll try to feel our way into the imaginative world of a person who is not so foreign to us.